next this three conference weeks. will now be recorded all right we're getting to titus the next three weeks i think we're going to titus one two and three um so it's a nice little short book that we can hopefully get some things out of and tonight we're obviously looking at chapter one and so what we're going to do is um first start off with a little oh how can i change this look at a little bit about who Titus was. So we don't know too much about him. I guess the most, most, most things we know about him are what, I guess from what Paul wrote to him or what Paul wrote about him. And so he pretty much was um, traveling near and far and preaching the gospel around. And we think he's most likely a convert, um, like Paul converted him, most likely in Antioch. And therefore, he was an uncircumcised Gentile convert. And I guess the sort of a test case in terms of like the Gentile being circumcised, circumcised that sort of issue um, and keeping the law around that. And in fact, like Paul even refused to let him be circumcised, um, showing about like the freedom that the Gentiles had under the law. Um, he was sent to Corinth twice and kind of, was the main person sorting out the dramas there uh, and Paul viewed him with high regard for doing that. We read in chapter one here in Titus, which we'll get into soon, that he was left in Crete um, to do some work for Paul. And we think that Paul wrote this letter to Titus probably after his release from prison, although not uh, not too sure on that, but that's when most people, I think, agree around that, which might be why this sort of letter is quite short and sharp and it's almost direct. Um, so just um, and that. And we also know that he traveled to Dalmatia, which is modern day Croatia, I think. Um, and potentially he died there, but we're not really too sure. But that's sort of the last uh, record that we hear about him. And so I guess, what do we read about Titus uh, in the Bible? So we read, I think we only have 12. 12 verses that mention him and um, these ones I thought showed I guess, what he was like in terms of his character so in 2 Corinthians 2 13 we read that um, I'm just paraphrasing the verse we're just reading the um, appropriate little section not the whole verse that there was no relief in my spirit because I did not find Titus there and so I read that as Titus brought a sense of relaxation to those around him. In uh, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6, we read that they were all encouraged you know, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. So he was also a sense of encouragement to those around him. In 2 Corinthians seven thirteen, we read that we rejoiced even more at the joy of Titus. So he spread joy to all those around him. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 6, and verse 16, we read uh, bits about his work. So it says, just as he had begun this work, so also he should complete it. And then 16, around, thanks be to God, who put in the heart of Titus the same devotion I have for you. So he was clearly a hard worker, and he got the job done. Um, and in 2 Corinthians 8, we read that he was um, a his partner and fellow worker and so he obviously was a great partner but also um, a leader himself and when we get to Titus chapter 1 which we're talking tonight we read that he um, Paul welcomes in the in the fourth verse in the sort of the introduction calls him a genuine son in the common faith so he was a faithful follower and so at least it shows a little bit around his sort of character and what he was like um, that I thought might just paint a picture of of him to start with. And then what um, we read in, let me just get it up, in chapter 1, obviously, and verse 5. So we read that. He says he left you in Crete. And so what was Crete like? So there's a few images there around some sort of... Um, there's a little theater there that was in Crete. And the top right one is in terms of, I guess, the size of the island of Crete um, compared to the North Island. So it's quite small in terms of land mass. Um, and it's obviously an island in the Mediterranean Sea. 
And so I guess through history, um, being an island, um, there's lots of piracy going on, pirates um, coming and claiming the island and then getting destroyed and then trying to claim it some more. I guess the Romans tried to stamp this out in around, uh, what was it, 67 BC. Um, some other interesting facts around the island of Crete, it was given as a gift to Cleopatra in 36 BC. And it was kind of an important place. It became an important place in the Roman Empire. Um, it had a lot of sort of new immigrants to the area. Um, a lot of Jews came, a lot of traders came, and it sort of became like a thriving sort of Roman um, spot. Um, they had at least, um, I guess, 15 prosperous cities on the island, and they were prosperous in terms of like sort of oil and wine production. Um, I guess just the classic Roman things like amphitheaters, um, temples, Roman baths, aqueducts, and all that sort of thing. Um, and the sort of the population was around 300,000 around those sort of times. Um, and they were even the Roman emperor lived on it um, for, a, um, for some amount of time. So that's a little bit around, I guess, what was Crete like. Um, and today, I guess, that first picture, actually, let me just quickly go back to it. That's what Crete is like today. So it's kind of like a quite nice little island paradise that I'm sure um, we, I guess it was, it was nice today weather, but I'm sure we'd like to be there um, sometime uh, during the winter months. And today's population of Crete is about 634,000, it looks like. So... It's almost double in terms of what it was back then at those sort of times. And so I guess more importantly, um, we read in, we might just read together, chat, uh, verses 10 to 16. And so this is um, not, I guess, we're going to jump around the chapter a little bit, so it's obviously not in order, but we're going to go start in chapter, verse 10, um, and read from there. So I'm reading from the NET, so starting at verse 10 to 16. So it says, this is about what are the people of Crete like. For there are many rebellious people, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those with Jewish connections, who must be silenced because they mislead whole families by teaching for honest gain what ought not to be taught. A certain one of them, in fact, one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Such testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply, that they may be healthy in the faith, and not pay attention to Jewish myths and commands of people who reject the truth. All is pure to those who are pure, but to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They profess to know God, but with their deeds they deny him, since they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good deed. So what the people of Crete, um, yeah, not the, not the nicest things to say about them. It's not what you would like to put on your CV or um, reasons to come visit. Um, but yeah, and, but I guess the point about this is that it kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'm sure we could have gone through the news this week, probably in any country in the world actually and found an article or a news story that probably relates to one of these things. And so I guess the point around that is that this book is still and this is still relevant to us today and the fact that these are still problems with, um, with the people of today, um, I mean, obviously. And so we're going to uh, just quickly maybe just going into a little bit more in terms of each verse. I guess in terms of verse 10, we read, for there are many. So it wasn't just a few sort of stragglers that were kind of letting everyone down. It was obviously quite a lot of them. And they were charged with, I guess, meaningless talk, which is quite relevant. Um, I guess they could talk all day probably about scripture or about lots of different things. Um, but there's a fact that it's described as meaningless. They probably didn't really do anything about it, even though they could talk all about it. And it talks about um, deceiving. And so I guess it's an action. So it wasn't, they were, I guess, actively going out of their way to deceive others um, and then following after those sort of wrong things in life. 
In verse 11, we read that, I guess, they must be silenced. Um, and that's, I guess, how wrong what they were saying was. It wasn't like, a, um, like a, oh, oh well, let me hear you out, and then we'll see what we think. It was a straight up, no, they must be silenced straight away. So they're obviously doing or talking and saying some uh, bad things, and obviously the fact that they were ruining those family relationships and like turning house, households, um, it was quite a big deal. In verse 12, it's uh, a bit funny in terms of that even their own person, their own prophet, um, was kind of saying some bad things about them. We've got, oh, yeah, that's right, we've got this one here. This is, this is Creek pretty much summed up. They're pretty much getting roasted here, um, all of them. So we have a beautiful sign here which says, Welcome to the island of Crete. Good times and great memories. Um, and then their own prophet comes in and says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And so we've got like a... Um, not exactly the motto that you want for your for your city or your country. Oh, it's not a country, don't worry. The city. Um, maybe it's a country. I'm going to confuse for a second. Anyway, it's not a good motto for the place, is it? Um, and so I guess it's probably, on one hand, attracted lots of people because it's probably obviously what humankind are uh, maybe into or that sort of Roman side of things back in the day. But it also probably put off lots of sort of people and more believers that side of things um and i guess paul in verse 12 uh, verse yeah, to oh continuing verse 12 i guess he didn't say that they're such a bad group that maybe we should go preach somewhere else um which we might have the tendency to do um and I guess, yeah, I guess it maybe shows the fact of not shying away from certain areas or particular groups um, to do that sort of preaching work. A random fact around that in terms of, um, like, the Cre apparently the Cretans were so notorious for their lies that the Greeks have formed a verb called, oh, that is criticize, which means to cretize which pretty much means to lie and to cheat. So they're obviously, that's just what they were well known for. They were pretty much just liars and just lies in terms of getting what they wanted and they would say whatever they want to get that. Um, and the fact that they were called evil beasts and lazy gluttons, I guess, most likely described their lifestyle. And um, let me just get a second. So they're probably... Um, a little bit like these guys. So we have the nice amphitheater here. I think this is on Crete. And then we have this guy here, and he's watching a show. And he's like, I should go hear this Titus guy, but this show is way too good. Um, and so he's not going to go listen to him. And then we have this guy over here in the bath, this Roman bath. And we have, um, he's saying or thinking, maybe Titus should come preach in the baths. He'd get way more people listening. And so that's kind of, uh, I guess, the summed up attitude of these sort of people, which Titus was um, um, trying to deal with. And ooh, let me get this thing. finally, verse 13, I guess we have um, the point around, I guess the first little bit is saying such testimony is true. So obviously Paul knew, this pe knew these people and he visited there. And so he knew firsthand for himself that that was um, the fact about what their prophet was saying. And I guess it's an interesting note in terms of that he says rebuke them sharply. And uh, we'll talk to about this in a second. But Paul also, because um, when he talks to Timothy, he talks to Timothy about instructing with meekness. But to Titus here, he says rebuking them sharply. So it's because of the difference, um, obviously, different people he was dealing with. But it's interesting sort of the contrast between them. And maybe it was the sort of the characteristics of Titus and Timothy that um, is why Paul maybe um, made them go that sort of way. And so I guess jumping back to verse 5, I guess what was Titus's job? 
So we read in verse 5 that the reason I left you in Crete was to set in order the remaining matters and to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so that was pretty much his uh, direction, the reason he was there. And it wasn't just in one town, just in the main city, it was in every town. So I guess we might just gloss over those words, but again, uh, when you think about it, I guess all the travel time, um, how he got from place to place, um, and obviously all the distractions sort of around him, um, maybe. And it kind of makes, it made me think, I wonder how long it took him to find what he was looking for um, in terms of appointing these elders. And the fact that Paul left him there shows that Paul was fully trusting in Titus and he knew he would get the job done, which goes back to those characteristics that we saw of Titus earlier. And I guess Paul wasn't necessarily needed to be there to babysit him um, uh, going through this. And so um, going back to that thing around Timothy, Paul also gives um, this list that we're going to look at in terms of qualities of um, what an elder must be like to Timothy. And I'm pretty sure it's exactly uh, pretty much exactly the same list. Um, even and then, so that was to the people in Ephesus. So we have Crete here, and then we have Ephesus there. And I guess it shows that it doesn't matter what people we've been preaching to, or I guess time periods, maybe even cultures. I guess we all need to show those same spiritual characteristics that I guess are timeless. And I guess what we want to look at today is that we can all. Um, I guess we're going to look at sort of the characteristics or attributes uh, that elders might have and then look into, I guess, uh, we're not just, I guess any one of us can be those sort of elders. I guess could be, we could be a leader or an elder at work or with our children, within our partners, within our friend groups, um, and then I guess what attributes we must have and how we can show these sort of qualities. So we're going to look at um, what the attributes listed are and maybe how and then how we can see that in action maybe today or just maybe a different um, version of it and then come up with an example uh, from Jesus's life uh, we know he's our church or a ecclesial elder um, I guess in Ephesians we read that he's the head of the ecclesia um, ecclesia uh, Ephesians 5 22 to 24 uh, he's well-known verses, which reads, um, oh, Wives, submit, your, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the ecclesia, as he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the ecclesia is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so with us, um, we have, I guess, the church elders or the leaders, and then we have Jesus as our overall ecclesial leader um it is i guess um and then god is i guess uh, above jesus there so what we're going to do uh let's alt tab so here's the attributes that we have um going down the list i think one of them was repeated but i've just left that once so these are the attributes and uh, so in verse six we have blameless um and husband of one wife, and having faithful children. Um, okay, we're just going to go through all of them because it's going to take too long to go through all of them. So what we're going to look at, oh, that didn't work, is we're going to go through some of these examples from Jesus and then to see, I guess, how we see that in action and then the example from Jesus. So I've gone for blameless. I've gone, how do we see that maybe in action today? I guess would see someone that was honest and transparent. And so for this, I guess, yeah, this is probably when I would have got examples if we were in live in person around an example from Jesus or a verse that might talk about it in his life or when he did it. Um, so we might, uh, it might take way too long to get examples online, but feel free to chuck them in the chat or we can talk about them afterwards if you've got some great examples of this um the verse i've gone for is mark 2 17 which says um oh i had pretty much when jesus says those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick 
I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so I kind of got with it. I just thought it was a very honest sort of statement that he made, and he was pretty much straight up with him in terms of the fact that he's come to call the right. I did not. He didn't come to call the righteous, but he's come to call the sinners to repentance. Um, so that's my example for that one. Um, in terms of the next attribute, husband of one wife, I guess this is talking about loyalty. Um, and so that's how we would see it today. And I've gone with uh, Ephesians 5, 25, which reads, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we know Christ, um, I guess, yeah, his love for the ecclesia and giving himself for us, um, how Jesus showed that. Uh, having faithful children, a little bit difficult in terms of an example for Jesus, but we've gone in terms of how we see that in action. If they teach others to love God, and so obviously that's what Jesus was all about. Um, one example we've gone for is Mark 6.34, which reads, As Jesus came ashore, he saw the large crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them many things. And so I guess the fact that he he saw everyone there and he f had compassion on them and that's i guess why he went and taught these things so he might have gone out of his way in terms of this and i guess there's obviously lots of other examples around um, him teaching around that the next attribute we have is that they're trusted with god's work and so i've said uh, we would see that today in someone that would work hard to help others and we've chosen for that um a little oh, Isaiah 42 verse 1 which reads behold my servant whom i uphold my elect one in whom my soul delights i have put my spirit upon him he will bring forth justice to the gentiles and also um in the transfiguration in matthew 17 while he was still speaking behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased hear him so I guess these verses I'm trying to get across that Jesus was doing um, God's work and he's um, doing it for God and um, that's very much the main point through there. Uh, not arrogant, we have, we would see that with someone that puts others' needs above their own and Jesus showed this by... Um, he, by, well, he said, for even the Son of Man did not come to ser be served, but to serve, and to give his life life as a ransom for many. So, and there are obviously lots of examples around um, putting others' needs before his own. We have a, an, an elder must be not prone to anger. So we've gone that they would treat everyone with kindness and has a calm manner. And we read a bit in Matthew around, I guess, the very famous words about Jesus saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So that's, I guess, the, um, yeah, I guess self-explanatory, really. And then uh, the other one, so I put another one on there. No, I didn't, but I got one of my notes. Um, in Luke 8, when we have the... Uh, the lady with the uh, woman of blood issue. Um, let me just get this up on my computer. We're we going to look at it. Give me a sec. Ooh, there we are. Um, in verse 40 to 47. I guess the point here was around that um, it's a calm manner. It was, you know, we know there was a busy crowd and everyone was pushing in around him. And then... Um, she obviously came and um, touched him and he was saying, oh, yep, there's power gone out of me. Who touched me? And he noticed this woman on the ground here. And instead of, I guess, um, yeah, I guess asking why she touched him or anything like that, she saw uh, verse 40, um, oh, 48, I guess. Well, he just said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Um, and so I thought that was a, an example of how in a, I guess, a quite a crazy situation that he had a calm manner and obviously showed kindness healing her um, in that example there. 
Um, in terms of not a drunkard, I've gone, I guess, around living in restraints of worldly uh, desires. So, um, and we've linked that in with Matthew 26 in terms of this is when um, Jesus is in the garden with, and uh, he's getting arrested with Judas. And he says, do you not, do you think that I cannot call on my father and that he would send me more than 12 legions of angels right now? How then would the scriptures that say it must happen this way be fulfilled? So I guess that verse is just showing that he obviously lived his life in constraint because we know he could have done so many things and obviously he could have, um, yeah, um, changed things, but he knew what he had to do in terms of fulfilling the scriptures. And so I guess it was a cool example, I thought, around how he lived in that sort of restraint in the world. Um, oh, we're only halfway. Let's speak more fast. Um, all right, not violence. Gently spoken and speaks well of others. Um, in Mark 9 and verse 38, we have an example of um, two of the disciples that uh, I think he's... Um, He's, oh, John. He says, John, um, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. And then in verse 40, Jesus says, for whoever is not against us is for us. Um, and so I've gone with this one. Um, I guess speaking well of others, I guess we can often um, maybe in terms of different denominations or even anything like that. But I guess the fact from Jesus I thought was cool was that if they're not against us, then they're for us. So um, that's a cool example of how he um, spoke well of others um, and through that. Not greedy for gain. Um, I've gone with shares with others. Um, and the story, oh, the verse there is about Zacchaeus and how I guess Jesus called him down and wanted to share his time with Zacchaeus, who everyone was like, well, don't spend time with him. But um he obviously wanted to for a reason, and um, that was a t cool time that I guess he shared that time. Um, I think the only, um, I don't, okay, hospitable, um, welcoming and friendly. We know how Jesus' character was obviously like that, uh, where all the children came to him in Matthew 9, verse 14, um, when the disciples tried to stop the children coming to him. He said, let the little children come to me and do not try to stop them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Um, and also, and another time in terms of when he healed the leper in Mark 1, um, I guess it just showed um, his kindness in that sort of situation um, and his friendliness uh, with, I guess, him being a leper and we know all the things around leprosy in those sort of days and ages and the fact that he had compassion and he healed him um, and said, I am willing, be cleansed. Uh, devoted to what is good. So I've gone with this that you'll see that you'd, they would live life for Christ. Um, not exactly an example. Oh, I guess it's just an Acts 10, 38. It says, um, with respect to Jesus from Nazareth, that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with them. So obviously there's lots of examples of Jesus um, doing good. Um, and that was just, I guess, a verse that described in terms of how he, that's kind of all he was doing with that because God was with them. Um, in terms of the attributes, quite a lot of them are quite similar. So in dotted versions say different things. Um, so... Um, the next one we've gone over self-controlled, so makes wise decisions based on the word of God. Um, and in John 4, uh, we're, pretty, we're reading, uh, my, oh, it says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. So I guess that's just showing that he's doing um, God's will in his life. We have uprights, so for that we put always puts their best effort in. Um, in Luke 13, it's about the narrow and wide door. We have exert every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, you will try to enter and will not be able to. So that's kind of, I guess, a reason for why we need to put our best effort in. And I guess an example I thought of, that I thought of um, 
with Jesus putting well in time was when obviously he was praying in anguish in the garden and we know that he was sweating um, like drops of blood so it must have been some obviously it was such a time of anguish for him and he was praying to um, to God and he was I guess putting it yeah doing doing it to his all and it says uh, in his anguish he prayed even more earnestly um, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground uh, I think we're nearly there we've got a couple more uh, holy um, so I put this for aims for perfection and again this is uh, I guess a verse that just described how Christ was um, had no sin for to this you were called since Christ also suffered for you leaving an example for you to follow in his steps he committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth when he was maligned he did not answer back when he suffered he threatened no retaliation and so I guess that's that perfect example that we aim for um, to do those things. Uh, temperate um, lives an orderly life. I guess it talks about dis- I guess it's dis- disciplining and controlling your body. Um, we know from Hebrews four fifteen we know how I guess the famous quote around Jesus being tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. So obviously he was controlling of his body and those um those same temptations that we live and um living an orderly life like he showed and the last one we have is um they hold fast to the faith which we've linked with um oh i can't see it because the thing is on my screen what did i write for that one i wrote has a strong faith and shares it with everyone and so for this example, I thought um, of was Luke 23, and this is Jesus on the cross with the two thieves. And so even in the craziest of times, um, hanging on the cross, we, re- we see how Jesus um, was talking to the thief. And I guess the key verse, um, I won't read them all out. Um, the other thief rebuked him saying don't you fear god since you are under the same sentence and we rightly so for we are getting what we deserve for what we did but this man has done nothing wrong then he then he said jesus remember me when you come in your kingdom and jesus said to him i tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise so i thought that was a cool example of even in the craziest of times they still he held fast to the faith and he was still um this um showing that example to um to those two thieves and to those around that were watching obviously all right we've gone through that list hopefully we're still awake um nearly there we've gone we get into verse 15 and 16 which we've always we've read already but um again it's it's talking about um we'll just read it quickly all is pure to those who are pure but to those who are corrupting and unbelieving nothing is pure but both their minds and consciences are corrupted they profess to know god but with their deeds they deny him since they are detestable disobedient and unfit for any good deed so if we are corrupt or if we all talk i guess it affects everything it affects our head our actions our lives and i guess this that verse 16 and the end of 15 keeps, I guess, talking about what the people of Crete were like. And so they were mask wearers. Um, they looked and maybe sounded and spoke like a Christian, but their lives didn't follow it up. Um, and I guess we know how easy it can be for us today for our minds uh, to be deceived or to slowly sort of be corrupted by everything around us. Um, but, yeah, but I guess we wanted to end on the first bit of that verse in verse 15 um on a positive which reads all is pure to those who are pure and i found a cool little excerpt from i think it was a meditation um online that i found which i just wanted to read um which reads the following have you ever noticed in life that some people seem to have a knack for seeing good all around them while others see nothing but what's wrong the pure in hearts those who have Christ in control of their lives learn to see good even in the midst of an evil world but those who have not yet allowed Christ to be in control of their lives seem to find evil in everything a mind filled with goodness has little room for what is evil so I thought that was a cool little um, cool little thing I guess it's showing how 
if our hearts are pure, then we're going to see good in all around us. And I guess if it's not, then we're going to focus on sort of those bad things. And I guess it made me realize how important, which is what we all know around what we fill our minds or our time with and how that it can affect and how much it can affect like our outlook on life um, and also the effect on others around you. Um, and also it can be affected in terms of uh, people that you hang around with or surround yourself with. Do we, are we around positive people, people who see good in things, people who see God in things? Um, and I guess the things maybe we need to think about is around do we look for the positives or do we look for the bad in the situation or the bad in the people? And what are we filling our heads or eyes with during the week that we don't need to be? And are we filling it with pure thoughts or things? And so as... And so we ask, like David in the Psalms, um, the classic Psalm 51, to create for me a pure heart, O God, renew a resolute spirit within me. And it's not only that we can see good if we have this pure heart, but we know from the um, Beatitudes in Matthew 5, we read it, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And so when your heart is pure, you'll not only see good around you, but you'll see God around you. Um, and you'll see him all around. You'll see him in the mirror. You'll see him in creation. You'll see him in the people you interact with, in your friends, in your family groups, um, just everywhere. And so I guess um, let's strive for these attributes that we've seen um, that have been described in Titus and hopefully seen how Christ um, lived them. So that God can create us in us of a heart that is pure, so that we can see good all around us, and also see God all around us. That is me done. So um, yeah, feel free to share any 